Finally, this uh, subcommittee hearing will begin. I apologize for all those in attendance. Uh, as you know, we have been busy on the floor, uh, but we will get, get down to business right now. I want to, uh, first of all, uh, thank uh, Ms. Norton, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, for her attendance here while we were on the floor. Uh, unfortunately, she now has to chair her own uh, subcommittee panel, and she has asked that we place her statement in the record, which, which we will do without objection. Uh, the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia will now come to order. I welcome uh, our ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, and members of the subcommittee hearing, witnesses, and all those in attendance. Today's hearing will examine H.R. 2517, the Domestic Partnership Benefits and Obligations Act of 2009. H.R. 2517 is intended to ensure equal treatment to lesbian and gay federal civil civilian employees by providing that same-sex partners be entitled to the same benefits available to a married federal employee and his or her spouse. The purpose of the hearing is to examine the merits of this legislation and to discuss its potential implementation and cost. The chair, ranking members, and the subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have uh, five legislative days to submit statements for the record. At this time, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the testimonies from the National Treasury Employees Union, the American Federation of Government Employees, uh, the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers, Human Rights Campaign, the Alternatives to Marriage Project, and parents, families, and friends of lesbians and gays be submitted for the record. Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, today the subcommittee convenes to discuss H.R. 2517, which is a measure introduced by our own colleague, Representative Tammy Baldwin of, of Wisconsin, and designed to provide equal treatment to lesbian and gay federal civilian employees by providing the same sex domestic partners be entitled to the same benefits available to a married federal employee and his or her spouse. While today's proceedings have been framed as a, leg as a legislative hearing, with the purpose of discussing the merits, composition, and impact of H.R. 2517, the real issues we are confronting today deal with the principles of equality, fairness, and inclusion in that workplace, principles that should be commonplace for the federal government as an employer, both in theory and in fact. Yet today, neither exists as tens of thousands of federal workers and their same-sex partners continue to be denied access to employee benefits such as health insurance or retirement savings which are customarily offered to employees with opposite-sex spouses. In many ways, it's baffling that this blatant inequality persists on the federal level. Despite the significant expansion in the availability of employment-related benefits and equal treatment for domestic partners among other public and private sector employees, excuse me, employers, we know that nearly 20 states and over 250 localities extend benefits to domestic partners of other public employees. And in the private sector, we have seen that the number of Fortune 500 companies that extend benefits to employees with same-sex partners has grown from 46 companies, about 9%, in 1997, to 286 companies, 57%, in 2009. Aside from the basic concepts of fairness and non-discrimination, the need to consider providing domestic partners benefit, excuse me, domestic partners benefits should to federal employees should also be evaluated in the light of the potential positive impact such policies can have on the federal government's recruitment and retention capabilities. Also, it's employee productivity and morale, and in some cases, the bottom line. As uninsured domestic partners must often rely on other government-sponsored health care programs and plans. I'd again like to thank the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Congressman Tammy Baldwin, and the 100-plus co-sponsors of H.R. 2175 for their work, their diligence, and their commitment to co correcting a longstanding injustice that has resulted in some federal workers not receiving equal pay for equal work. Uh, additionally, I'd like to point out that recent action taken by the Admo Obama administration in providing same-sex partners of federal employees with certain benefits already available to spouses of heterosexual employees Although these offerings fall short of the full range of benefits currently available to married couples, the President's actions are nevertheless a step in the right direction, and they must be complemented by congressional legislative action, which is what brings us to this afternoon's consideration of H.R. 2175. 
the Domestic Partners Benefits Act of 2009. I look forward to a healthy and robust discussion on all aspects of the measure before us, and I'd like to thank today's witnesses for taking the time to be with us today as we explore this important issue. I would now like to uh, call upon our witnesses. It is the committee's policy that all witnesses are to be sworn. I'll ask you to please rise, raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee is the truth, the, tro the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will show that the witnesses have asked, answered in the affirmative, and I allow now uh, ask uh, our ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, the gentleman from Utah, uh, for a five-minute opening statement. Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do appreciate it, and I appreciate the work that you've put into to this effort, and I truly do uh, look forward to listening and, and learning and uh, understanding your perspective. I hope there can also be a candid dialogue about some of the respect and traditions of this country. Um, with this, I, I again want to thank the, the chairman for holding this hearing today and discussing H.R. 2517, the Domestic Partnership Benefits and Obligations Act of 2009. I'd also like to thank Reverends Henry Gaston. Uh, Patrick Walker, Donald Sadler, and other members of the Minister's Conference of D.C. and vicinity for their presence and their participation in this ongoing discussion. I, I look forward to hearing testimony from the various witnesses that we will today. I, like most people in this country, uh, am in favor of preser preserving traditional marriage. To me, marriage carries a direct religious significance in addition to other uh, uh, connotations. But perhaps most significant to H.R.'s 2517 is that the term marriage is also a legal matter and a court of law is involved in the marriage process. What we cannot do with this legislation is create laws which are similar for different people. While, while we are told that because opposite sex couples have option to marry, they are perceived with, they are provided with similar benefits. What I'm concerned about is draw, trying to draw that distinction in having an unintended consequence of actually offering and creating a separate class or category of people that then would uh, obtain or be given rights above and beyond other people who don't choose to participate in those lifestyle choices. Whether or not a heterosexual couple is dating and living together can meet all other standards except for the portion of regarding the couple's same-sex status is of concern to me. If they can, if they can, yet are not affected not afforded the same rights, this bill is directly discriminatory against heterosexual couples. And that, to me, is one of the unintended consequences that I have a serious concern and question. I'd appreciate it if the witnesses would address. I, I, marriage, by another name, is of concern to me, and I think uh, the majority of Americans. At the same time, I want to be respectful of individuals and their rights to choose. And I'd I just like to relay a very brief story that's, that's very personal to me uh, in my great Aunt Louise. Uh, she has since passed away. Uh, she was happily married for a long time. And yet when she passed away, um, she ended up living with another woman. It was not necessarily an intimate relationship. It was not necessarily a relationship that was other than based on the fact that she had an economic need. She had a uh, security need. Uh, there was a, a friendship need. And yet I worry that maybe given the definitions of where this legislation is trying to go, that if she had been, she wasn't, but if she had been a federal employee, that there would be other people that get benefits above and beyond where, where she had been. And I also worry that heterosexual couples who have made a decision not to get married would be discriminated against uh, along the way. I also have concerns about fraud and abuse, the ability to enforce these types of things, the cost that will be associated with them. I think we're all valid points. But at the same time, I think we can approach this with a, uh, a moral attitude that says, we want to do what's right for people and for individuals, but also have a respect for the traditions of this country that... Um, marriage, defined as a marriage between a, one man and one woman, is something that this country feels strongly about. And I do, 
I do as well. So with that, I look forward to hearing, not so much speaking. Uh, I thank the chairman and look forward to, to hearing your testimony. Uh, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, now uh, I, I would like to offer five minutes for an opening statement to the Honorable Tammy Baldwin, the lead sponsor of this measure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Mem Member Chaffetz and uh, members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today at what is a very historic uh, hearing. I also want to thank uh, OPM Director John Barry for taking the time to testify in support of this legislation and wish to thank um, Ambassador Guest and all of our uh, distinguished panelists today for their leadership. As um, my colleagues on this committee know, the federal government employs more than 1.8 million civilian employees, making it the nation's largest employer. Historically, the federal government has been a leader in offering important benefits to its employees. But today we are lagging behind. And this is particularly true regarding the extension of benefits to employees with same-sex partners. As it stands, some federal employees do not receive equal pay and benefits for equal contributions. And the government is not keeping pace with leading private sector employers in recruiting and retaining top talent. Indeed, a large number of America's major corporations, as well as state and local governments and educational institutions, have extended employee benefit programs to cover their employees' domestic partners. These employers include top American corporations, such as GE, Chevron, Boeing, Texas Instruments, Lockheed Martin, and American Airlines, whom you'll hear from later this afternoon. Under the Domestic Partnership Benefits and Obligation Act, a federal employee and his or her same-sex domestic partner would be eligible to participate in federal retirement benefits, life insurance, health benefits, workers' compensation, and family and medical leave benefits to the same extent as married employees and their spouses. These employees and their domestic partners would likewise be subject and would assume the same obligations as apply to married employees and their spouses, such as anti-nepotism rules and financial disclosure requirements. I want to make very clear that this bill contains strong anti-fraud provisions requiring employees to file an affidavit of eligibility in order to extend benefits to their domestic partners. And this is significant, especially considering that we do not require married employees to show documentary evidence of their marriages when claiming spousal benefits. The penalties for fraudulently claiming a domestic partnership would be the same as penalties for fraudulent uh, claim of marriage. For example, intentional false statements on federal employee health benefits form is punishable by a fine of up to $10,000 and imprisonment up to five years. Mr. Chairman, I appear before you uh, today both as the lead author of this legislation, but also as a lesbian federal employee who has been in a committed relationship with my partner, Lauren, for over 13 years. Over the years, Lauren and I have examined the differences between my benefits and my ability to provide for her compared to the benefits enjoyed by my straight uh, married colleagues in Congress. Uh, some quick number crunching would demonstrate that the difference between my health benefits and yours, just with regard to that benefit alone, um, over the course of my 10 years in Congress, is measured in five figures. This is a significant inequality. And heaven forbid anything would happen to me, but Lauren would not be eligible to receive the survivor annuity from my pension, nor health insurance survivor benefits. Unlike spouses of my colleagues, Lauren is also not currently subject to any of the obligations related to my federal service. I find this also disturbing. All members of Congress file annual financial disclosures. Married members must file important information about their spouse's income, investments, debts, gifts received, etc. Surely the public interest requires that these obligations also apply to partners of gay and lesbian office holders. 
Last month, as you mentioned in your opening statement, Mr. Chairman, President Obama signed a presidential memorandum on federal benefits and non-discrimination, which directs the Office of Personnel Management and the State Department to extend certain benefits to the same-sex partners of federal employees within the confines of existing federal law. Although the memorandum is an important step in providing same-sex partner employees with benefits already available to spouses of heterosexual employees, it falls short of providing the full range of benefits. President Obama recognized and acknowledged that fact when he signed the memorandum, calling it just a start. He went on to say that, as Americans, we are all affected when our promises of equality go unfulfilled. President Obama recognized that full extension of benefits will require an act of Congress and proclaimed his strong support for the legislation that you are reviewing today. Chairman Lynch, thank you again for this opportunity uh, to review the bill and to testify before the committee. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. John Berry, who's the, he serves as the Director of the United States Office of Personnel Management, which manages the federal government's civil service uh, employees. Prior to Mr. Berry's appointment, he was the director of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the director of the Smithsonian Zoological Park. Mr. Berry, you recognized for five minutes. Oop, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's an honor to be back with you today, and Congresswoman Baldwin, thank you for your leadership on this issue. Um, it is an honor to be here to represent on behalf of the President and uh, his administration our strong support for H.R. 2517. Uh, this critical legislation will provide health, life, and survivor benefits to same-sex domestic partners of federal employees. I applaud Congresswoman Baldwin and the many co-sponsors of H.R. 2517 for introducing this bill and you, Mr. Chairman, and the members for hosting this hearing today. Both the White House and the Office of Personnel Management wholeheartedly endorse the passage of this legislation. In my written testimony for the record, Mr. Chairman, I've also mentioned some technical fixes that we're seeking, and I will make uh, all of my staff available to you and the committee staff uh, to work with you to provide any support that may be of assistance uh, in, in addressing those corrections. At my confirmation hearing, Mr. Chairman, I said two of my primary goals as the director of o OPM would be first to make the federal government the country's model employer, and the second was to attract the best and the brightest Americans to federal service. The passage of H.R. 2517 is essential to accomplishing both of these goals. Under current law, the federal government cannot offer basic benefits like health insurance, life insurance, dental or vision insurance to the domestic partners of our gay and lesbian federal employees. This policy undermines the federal government's ability to recruit and retain the nation's best workers. Historically, the federal government has in many ways been a progressive employer. In this case, however, we have fallen behind the private sector and 19 states, including Alaska and Arizona. Almost 60 percent of the Fortune 500 companies and 83 percent of the Fortune 100 companies already offer this benefit to their same-sex domestic partners. Uh, this co these companies include, as Congresswoman Baldwin mentioned, and American Airlines, who is here today, and I commend their leadership in that regard uh, on the next panel, but also companies uh, that you might not expect, Chevron, Food Lion, Archer Daniels, Lockheed Martin, many, many others. The federal government simply does not effectively compete with these companies for every talented person we fail to offer comparable job benefits to our employees. And in fact, Mr. Chairman, if I could just add, uh, many of these companies are in direct competition with us. Uh, we spend quite a bit of money doing security clearances on employees. And uh, after they have that clearance, that clearance goes with the employee, not with the position. And so essentially, if an employee can be recruited away, these are the, these are the kind of tools where we can invest a lot of money and then that employee walks out the door to, to a Lockheed Martin or to others who need employees with security clearances. Um, we ought not allow that, that uncompetitive edge. The President, as Congresswoman Baldwin has already mentioned, took an important first step towards addressing these shortfalls 
when he signed a memorandum last month directing all federal agencies to extend benefits to same-sex domestic partners of federal employees to the extent now permitted by law. But as the President noted when he issued this, uh, this legislation is needed to offer gay and lesbian federal workers true equality in benefits and ensure fairness in the workplace. I'd also note that the cost of extending these benefits to same-sex partners is negligible. Additional premiums for providing life, dental, and vision insurance to same-sex domestic partners will be borne entirely by the gay and lesbian employees who enroll their partners in those benefit plans. Adding domestic partner health insurance and survivor benefits for both federal workers and retirees would cost approximately $56 million in the year 2010. This marginal increase equates to about two-tenths of one percent of the entire cost to the government of our federal employees health insurance program. Simply put, extending benefits to same-sex partners is a good, practical, bottom-line business decision, and it allows the federal government to retain our competitive edge in the 21st century. This legislation is a valuable uh, business opportunity for the federal government to enhance our recruitment and our retention, retention efforts. And just as important, this bill shows that we recognize the value of every American and their families and their relationships and are committed to the ideal of equal treatment under the law as our founders envisioned. Mr. Chairman, thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering any questions the committee might have. Thank you. It's great to have you up here again before our, com our, our committee, your frequent uh, uh, witness here. And, and again, we appreciate you, especially under today's circumstances. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, allow myself five minutes for the uh, first round of questioning. And uh, the way con Congress works, as you both know very well, that we usually have to be in five different places at the same time. So. As members come in and, and leave, I'll, I'll afford them an ample and full opportunity uh, to ask questions at this hearing. And because we have so much going on, I'm going to give the other members on the panel an opportunity to submit questions to you in writing. And I'll, I'll say five days uh, would like to have the responses to those, those questions if, if they're offered. Uh, 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 Ms. Baldwin, uh, Currently, there are three states uh, that recognize same-sex marriage. Uh, that's Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Iowa. And another three states, Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire, will begin to recognize same-sex marriages within the next six months based on legislation that has recently passed. And while the process in California is still somewhat in flux, uh, marriages performed there between June 16, 2008, and November 4, 2008, are currently recognized by that state. Uh, there are, of course, federal employees in each of, of those states, and some of them may have, had, ha may have uh, same-sex spouses. However, the federal government cannot recognize marriages because of OMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, and these employees, therefore, are not eligible for the benefits provided to federal employees with opposite-sex spouses. And, and my, my question is, how are those uh, folks going to be affected by your legislation is H.R. 2517 intended to cover those employees as well? It, the way this would work, um, the federal employee who's in a same-sex uh, partnership, whether they are married in um, a marriage recognized at their state level or not, would have to file um, an affidavit uh, uh, of eligibility relating to their domestic partnership in order to receive the benefits that are being proposed in the bill before you. Um, in terms of having federal, uh, complete federal recognition of the marriages in those states, that would require a separate act of Congress, one that I support strongly, which would be repeal of Section 3 or Title 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, um, legislation that I expect to be offered by colleagues later in this session. Um, but the way this uh, legislation would work in practice probably recognizes the fact we have federal employees around the world in every state of the union 
and, um, and that they will go, the states will go at different paces in terms of recognizing uh, marriages. And so it made much more sense to create this mechanism to provide the employment fringe benefits, and that's what this bill is, is limited to. I would note, in addition to your um, iteration of states that have enacted um, uh, recognition of marriage, um, two uh, additional jurisdictions, New York State and the District of Columbia, have um, approved uh, either by executive order or by act of the council um, to recognize uh, same-sex marriages performed in other jurisdictions. So they sort of add to the um, number of jurisdictions that at the state or local level will recognize marriage. Now, thank you. Uh, and you're right. Uh, uh, I think the, uh, the action here in D.C. will come before the committee in some, some form. Uh, I know that uh, the city council has approved that. Uh, measure as well. Uh, Director Berry, in his June 17th memorandum, President Obama directed you and the Secretary of State to begin the process of, of extending some federal benefits to qualified same-sex domestic partners of uh, federal employees. Can you give us an update on how that is, is going, even the, the limited portion that's gone forward? and? Uh, do you see any problems in this? Uh, how is it proceeding? No, Mr. Chairman, I, I think uh, uh, that's going along well. We uh, are well on uh, schedule to stay within the 90 days that the President has established uh, for us to issue uh, and to come out with uh, any regulations that would be required. Uh, we are going to be issuing guidance to the uh, federal agencies to assist them. Uh, OPM and state have done a very thorough review of our processes and code uh, involved, but the other agencies uh, have, have, we did not have the opportunity or the time to do that. Um, for example, the General Services Administration is responsible for uh, and is uh, the agency charged with relocation benefits so that if federal employees move, uh, how that is handled is through the General Services Administration. So. Uh, for example, that would be an agency that we would, you know, we're asking each agency uh, to do a thorough review of their law, and that's what the president has asked. Um, and then we'll be collecting that information and collating it and getting back to the president within 90 days. We just had the uh, chief human capital officer's uh, monthly meeting yesterday, and uh, that was on our agenda. And so we ex discussed that in full. Uh, everybody is going through and going forward with their process. So I think we're right on schedule, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, let me follow up then. Uh, your, your testimony earlier mentioned the fact that the bill would exclude uh, annuitants with same-sex partners from electing benefit coverage. Is, is OPM's uh, position that these individuals should be covered by the bill or not? Uh, yes, sir, that they, they should be. Uh, and in fact, the dollar estimate that I gave you uh, actually presumes uh, that, that that amount presumes that you would make the corrective change to include annuitants. Explain uh, that. Reti there's, retirees. There is a possible funding offset here, right? Uh, well, there's actually, in the short term, there is a, uh, a savings to the government in the short term because uh, if federal employees who are retiring uh, or who have recently retired take a, would take a lower payment uh, in exchange for, you know, for having the survivor benefit for their annuitant, for their partner, their domestic partner, just as it is with the spouse now. And uh, so short term, there is, is a savings. Um, in the long term, uh, there would be a slight increase, but um, uh, that is factored into the number that I, I gave you in my testimony of the, the $56 million, and if I could just check, Nancy, right. that is correct. Okay. Okay. So what you're saying is that right now, under the op they don't have the option right now to reduce, the, to seek the lower. No, uh, sir. Like myself, if you want to include your spouse, you take a lower, lower benefit, and uh, right now, uh, for uh, for gay and lesbian uh, employees of the federal government, they're all maxing out right now. They're all taking the single, the highest uh, option, right, because they're forced to do that. And Absolutely. And if they take the lower amount, then it'll cause a savings uh, uh, for, the, for the government. Uh, in his uh, memorandum, uh, President Obama reaffirmed the civil service merit system. Uh, principle that makes it unlawful to discriminate against federal employees on the basis of factors unrelated to job performance, including 
uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, and President Obama directed you to issue guidance to federal agencies requiring compliance with this principle. How, how has that, uh, that proceeded? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're, we're again right on schedule with that. Uh, our council's office is uh, working on preparing that, and we will meet the 90-day standard that the president has established. Uh, my hope is we actually uh, have it done in less than 90 days, but uh, we will definitely be within the 90-day period the president has set up. Now, I do, I do know that there was a, uh, a situation over at the Office of Special Counsel. I want to ask you about that. Uh, as you know, the, the U.S. Office of Special Counsel is responsible for protecting uh, federal employees from discrimination based on sexual orientation and for enforcing the cornerstone of the merit system. However, the recently departed uh, Special Counsel, who is still being investigated by the OPMIG, uh, the Office of Personal Management Inspector General, uh, refuses to do so, excuse me, refused to do so, past tense, because of uh, personal ideological beliefs. And unfortunately, the President has been slow to nominate a new special counsel, which means enforcement of this right continues to be somewhat of a gray area, I, I imagine. Uh, you have been in touch with the acting leadership of the OSC, the Office of Special Counsel, about the issue, and I need to know where that sits right now. Mr. Chairman, uh, I am very honored uh, and extremely pleased uh, that my general counsel now at the Office of Personnel Management uh, was a previous uh, special counsel uh, and held that position uh, in, uh, during the Clinton administration. Um, and is an outstanding attorney and, and one of the brightest legal minds with federal employees and retirees issues in this town. Um, and I know that she uh, is uh, in close contact with both the Special Counsel's Office and the Merit Systems Protection Board. Um, it, it, they are independent agencies, sir, so uh, I, they, they, you know, OPM does not directly affect or control either their budget or their staffing. Uh, but we do closely coordinate uh, in terms of logic, rationale, and, and, and actions. Um, right now, the President has made clear in that memorandum uh, that it is the law of the land that uh, uh, any non-work-related, uh, irrelevant factor uh, is inappropriate for consideration in the federal workplace. And uh, that's going to be the responsibility for uh, whoever the special counsel that he appoints to enforce as the prosecutor and the Merit Systems Protection Board is the adjudicating agency uh, to rule on those, on those actions. But the President has made clear for all of the management of the federal government, senior executives, managers included, um, that he expects uh, the law to be enforced. Very good. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, the distinguished gentleman from North Virginia, Mr. Connolly, has any questions at this point, or do you need a minute? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd ask unanimous consent that my opening statement be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, in my district, I represent about 56,000 federal employees and maybe as many retirees, and, uh, at, and lots of federal contractors. And uh, most of those federal contractors and most of the large employers in my district uh, in fact, already have uh, domestic partner benefit, uh, benefits programs uh, because they understand how important it is for recruitment and retention. And I wonder, especially Mr. Berry, um, uh, but also you, Representative Baldwin, um, might comment on that whole issue of the challenge of recruitment and retention as we move forward. Uh, we've got a lot of federal employees ready to retire in the baby boom generation. How are we going to re replace them and retain those we replace them with if, in fact, we don't include this as part of the benefits portfolio moving forward? Um, you raise a very, very important point about um, attracting the top talent for government service. And um, I don't have any aggregate data for you. It's hard to pin down. But I would tell you that in, um, I, I have uh, some very powerful anecdotal information from um, my home state of Wisconsin, uh, which just last week, by the way, enacted a domestic partnership registry and will be shortly extending those benefits to state employees. I represent a district with um, a world-class university, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I have received as a member of Congress 
panicked calls from chair, uh, chairpersons of um, departments at the medical school saying, is there anything you can do about domestic partnership? We have the chance to land one of the most world-respected you know, pediatric oncologists, and they're saying if, if they can't uh, cover their, if, if their domestic partners aren't recognized, um, uh, partner isn't recognized with benefits, they're going to accept an offer at another world-class university. We've had a, a researcher from the engineering school um, leave the state with an NSF grant that w totaled more than it would have cost to implement the domestic partnership benefits statewide in Wisconsin uh, because of the indignity of the e unequal treatment in employment. So there, I think there are countless um, anecdotal uh, 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 accounts of um, why, when you can't offer these benefits, you lose uh, top talent. If I could, uh, I'll just uh, add to uh, and concur with the, the comments of the Congresswoman. Um, you know, this is essential in maintaining our competitive edge in the 21st century. And uh, uh, we spend, government spends, between three and $15,000, depending on the complexity of the security clearance, uh, on our employees now. And as you well pointed out, uh, federal contractors who require those clearances who are desperate to get them and who have a hard time getting them, by providing this benefit, uh, essentially the government incurs the cost of doing the evaluation on the federal employee, does the initial training of that employee and all of the expense associated with that, and then that employee is sucked away by either the Lockheed Martin or, or General Dynamics or whoever is who provides that benefit if, if this is a concern in that, in that case. And it, it, it is, uh, this is, Quite simply, I look at this as a bottom line business judgment. This is about recruiting and retaining. And it, not only do we need to be effective in recruiting across the nation, uh, but we've got to retain the employees, especially those uh, employees with security clearances that are, we're at risk of losing because of this uncompetitive situation. Good. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to say I, I completely concur. And I think that's the correct way to frame the issue for the federal government moving forward. Um, how will we stay competitive in the uh, uh, employ, uh, employment market when we are competing with lots of large employers who, in fact, as a matter of course, provide these benefits? And so uh, I'm going to be an enthusiastic supporter of uh, H.R. 2517 uh, and encourage my colleagues to do the same. I thank the chair. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I started to chat with you on the floor about this, but um, as I read this bill, doesn't it discriminate in terms by giving greater uh, federal benefits than opposite sex couples who may not be married? The option exists for opposite sex couples to marry uh, in every state of the union and so it is easily cured uh, if they want to seek uh, those benefits um, for them to enter the institution of marriage. Aside from the states that the chairman uh, mentioned that opportunity does not exist um, in all states for same-sex partners and to the extent that it does exist in any states the Defense of Marriage Act which is currently embodied in federal law would prohibit the federal government from recognizing those uh, marriages in those states that, that do so, recognize it. So in other words, we have to come up with another mechanism uh, in order to offer fringe employment benefits, this is what we're talking about in this bill, uh, to the same-sex partners of federal employees. So a heter heterosexual couple is not going to get the same, a man and a woman living together, are not going to get be able to get the same benefits as somebody who is a same-sex couple. Should they um, desire those benefits, they would have the option of marrying. And that is a choice open to them, but not open to the same-sex partners uh, of federal employees. Mr. Barry, did you care to comment on that? Or? I, I would just, I would reinforce what the Congresswoman has said. I, I think there's, a, there's an effective alternative there. Um, whereas it, it, the, the same alternative does not exist for, for same-sex uh, uh, what, What's going to be, the, the, what is the, de, the determining factor? Intimate relationships? And, I, I mean, how well, are we going to define and enforce and 
Well, it will be, it, it, as required in the legislation, it, it is an affidavit, and uh, it has substantial penalties. Um, you know, currently, our inspector general at the Office of Personnel Management is responsible for enforcing fraud. So would you want, would you want uh, heterosexual couples to just fill out an affidavit? Why, why wouldn't they just do that? Well, under this case, it is defined specifically in the legislation as same-sex. Um, you know, but it does, uh, that affidavit has, is criminal perjury. It would, uh, it could be, it's enforceable okay, but not you're, only you're by. you're a heterosexual couple. Why can't you just fill out an affidavit and say, yeah, you know, I've got a relationship. We plan to live together. And but as we said earlier, the um, option is available for a heterosexual couple to marry and then the, um, these employment benefits would flow uh, automatically on the basis of, of that marriage and that spousal relationship. Uh, how, how same many? sex couples, um, you know, in, in, uh, because of, of the Defense of Marriage Act, even those same sex couples who are afforded the um, right to marry in certain states would not have those marriages recognized currently um, at the federal level. And so this is a mechanism that allows um, uh, people like myself who's been in a you know, 13 plus year relationship to be able to uh, provide for my family. What, what percentage of people do we think are going to participate? And the number I've heard is like 1.5%. I mean, do we have any sort of cost estimate here? Uh, the, you will have a witness later who is um, very expert on, on this topic. Um, obviously, uh, uh, Director Barry has some uh, data already. Uh, but the estimate that I have seen in terms of, I haven't seen a percentage, but a, roughly 30,000 uh, federal employees, is that a is that close to yours? Uh, or? Do you have any idea what percentage that of, is? Of, uh, of, of the 1,800, uh, this was, now these are uh, 2003 numbers, Congressman, but uh, of the, of the 1.8 million uh, retirees, it's estimated that 0.29%, uh, 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 5,400 are expected to elect the domestic partner survivor benefit. And that's, okay. that's the basis on which... Sorry to cut you off. I've got like sure. seconds to go. So oh, okay. I, I appreciate that you've, you've highlighted the statistic that we, I was after. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Barry, uh, the Office of Personnel Management stated in the Senate uh, Homeland Security, Security and Government Affairs hearing on September 24, 2008, and I recognize how, how new you are to this position, it said, quote, uh, that they do not they do, quote, not serve as a central clearinghouse for all federal employees and therefore would not have the records nor resources to collect and maintain such affidavits, end quote. If we have any sort of assessment as to how huge the bureaucracy is going to have to become in order to not only maintain but to service those, to enforce those, I mean, this, is, this creates a Pandora's box of problems, it seems to me, that no, Congressman, it, it, this is actually going to be fairly easy to administer. E each of the agencies would just keep the affidavit on file. Um, that would be available for investigation against fraud by any inspector general. Uh, if fraud was discovered, it would be referable to the U.S. attorney. Um, this, this, we see no additional cost uh, associated with this. And, that, and, the, and the numbers we're talking about and, and the experience of the state and the private sector in this regard um, show this out over the past 10 years, that there is not a huge increase, there is not a huge cost, there is not a huge paperwork burden, and, and, and so we do not anticipate any in the federal government in this and are fully ready, this administration is ready to implement it immediately. If you just, in wrapping up, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I just appreciate if you go again look at that September 24, 2008, because I feel like the OP, OPM was somehow compelled to have a fairly substantive uh, approach to this and saying they're not... They do not serve. Anyway, go back and look at that quote. If you, it, you just understand, I'd like to un better understand why you come to the, you know, this is easy conclusion. And just, you know, in 2008, they said, no, this would be except difficult. So with that, I'll yield back the balance of my overtime. Okay. Let, let me just follow up on, on some of what uh, the ranking member was asking about. Uh, I had an opportunity. I have very, very, very good staff here, and uh, I probably know more about this than I ever needed to know. But uh, showed me some studies that have been done of all the the companies out there in the United States. Uh, some are international firms that provide domestic benefits, uh, you know, to to domestic partners, same-sex couples, and they surveyed all those companies and they try to figure out what's the percentage, what's the take-up utilization rate among those uh, same-sex couples that, that could have. 
and it was very, very low. Uh, the ranking member was not far off. It was around 2 percent, very small. And uh, I, worry, I wonder about that uh, in, in the federal employee context where you have a situation where someone's going to have to file an affidavit and as under the pains and penalty of perjury, some very serious penalties here, $250,000, five years in prison, uh, fairly dramatic uh, consequences for, for fraud. And, uh, I'm, and, and also if you put the overlay of what you had mentioned before about security clearances, uh, you're going to have employees here how, who I think might be even more reluctant than on the private sector to take up uh, these benefits. They don't want to file that affidavit with their employer, with their department. Now, my understanding was that uh, the affidavits would be filed with OPM. Is that correct, or is it with the individual departments? As, as it is now written, I believe Congresswoman Baldwin has uh, recommended it be filed with OPM. One of the technical amendments we were going to urge, because each of the agencies follows uh, their own uh, pay payroll and retirement paperwork until the person's retired. Once they're retired, that paperwork would come to us. So for existing annuitants, we would cover that. Right. But otherwise, for active employees, it would be with each, each bureau and department. Okay, okay. That's well, what we would recommend as a technical amendment or to improve the legislation as one of the we do in the written legislation. Okay, and I don't believe that's a hostile amendment, is it? No, sir. That would be very welcome. Okay. Let me ask you something else. Earlier in your testimony, uh, Director Berry, you said something about retirees utilizing uh, same-sex benefits. However, my reading of the bill, this would just be for active employees, and so Again, retirees would not be eligible. Am I misreading that? You are not misreading that, but as um, Director Barry indicated, he has a number of, in their review of the legislation, um, OPM has come up with a number of technical uh, recommendations, and that would be one. And as you heard earlier, it has some um, at least near-term uh, offsetting effects in terms of the cost of the bill, so it would be, uh, I think, something that we should um, certainly consider. Mr. Chairman, as a, as a friendly amendment, again, as a technical amendment, we would recommend uh, the inclusion of existing annuitants and allowing that program uh, for them. And, and so we, we would be happy to work with your staff and uh, to, to achieve that. All right. Well, I, I haven't. That's something that's new to me right now, but that's why we have hearings. Uh, let me just say this. that uh, I, I know there has been a, a doctrinal uh, priority to try to treat active employees and retirees the same. And that's been something that, that, you know, the federal government has tried to do as an employer generally. Uh, I don't know. I just, I, I just, I, I think I have to chew on that for a little bit and figure out what, what that really means. It's new. It's obviously just come up. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try to work with you again. Uh, I'm sure I've exhausted my five minutes. Uh, Mr. Connolly, you recognize for five minutes. Well, um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask Mr. Berry, from his point of view, um, given his responsibilities, what kind of feedback are you getting from agency heads, federal agency heads, in terms of the value of this as a potential tool for recruitment and retention? Uh, there's no question, Mr. Connolly, this is a very valuable tool. Uh, as, as has been noted in the testimony, is you know 83 percent of the Fortune 100 companies in this in our country today provide this. Those companies are not doing this out of social work or charitable purposes. They are doing it because it is a valuable recruitment and retention tool uh, in their personnel portfolio. Um, so they are not motivated here on some social agenda. Uh, they are not restricted. Uh, uh, by uh, some of the, the discussion that, uh, that the federal government is encumbered by. They're making this as a bottom line business assessment and judgment. And, uh, and that is specifically the position. As I talk with cabinet secretaries and the president and the White House staff about this, um, it is clear uh, this will be a helpful tool. 
Um, you know, it is not going to answer all the problems of the federal government. We have many other issues to deal with. As you know, hiring reform is going to be one. I was talking with Congressman Chavitz about our efforts to increase our hiring of veterans. We have many efforts we're going to be undertaking. But this is, again, an important tool that's going to help us maintain our cutting edge and, and uh, with, with the private sector here in the 21st century. And, and I would just uh, observe in closing, because we have to vote, I know, Mr. Chairman, I, I find it odd that somebody would even suggest inferentially that this provision, this benefit provision, could itself constitute discrimination against folks of opposite sex uh, relationships when, of course, the screaming contradiction of that question is that marriage is available to people in that situation and it is not in all but a handful of states to those of same-sex partnerships. And so that's why you have to, as Representative Baldwin indicated, look at other ways of trying to address the issue of uh, fairness in the provision of benefits. And I uh, certainly look forward to expanding that conversation with Mr. Chaffetz and his colleagues in the weeks and months coming. I thank the Chair. I thank the gentleman. Uh, all right, as you know, we have votes and uh, I'm going to have to allow the witnesses to go out and vote. Uh, here's what I'd like to do. Uh, we'll go and do votes. I don't want to dismiss this panel. Uh, I'm, when we come back, I'm going to maybe have a couple more questions, but, uh, and then I'll give you each, say, three minutes, because we have not exhausted all the questions that, that could arise on this issue, and I'll ask you to just try to fill in those gaps that we may have missed in our questioning, and, and then, that, then I'll pull the next panel, okay? All right, thank you. So we're, we're in recess. They tell me it's just one vote. Uh, so, so we might be back in, say, 20 minutes. Okay. That uh, since the federal government does not at this point recognize marriages other than traditional marriages, one man, one woman, that from the federal government standpoint, everybody outside that group is unmarried, period. And so, so it's really not a conflict, is what, what it's saying. But to get it on the record, and we're on the record, I just wanted to ask the, the director and, and the, sponsor, the, co -sponsor, the lead sponsor of this bill whether it is your understanding that that is the case as well. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, it is my understanding uh, that, that what you have just described is the situation. But to be extra sure, because obviously in, in light of this, uh, we would, uh, our council uh, would like to work with yours and, and uh, the councils from the uh, Department of Justice to make sure uh, that we resolve this issue so that we do not have any unfavorable treatment for uh, either federal employees or retirees in those states that do use that term in, as an unintended consequence. So. Um, uh, so we would uh, be happy to work with the author and the committee uh, to make sure that we, we, we draft this correctly to ensure equal treatment uh, in those cases. Okay. Ms. Bowen? I would associate my, um, myself with the comments of Director Barry on the, with regard to this point. Um, there's a, certainly a strong reason why that language uh, originated in the bill uh, in earlier iterations before any state had recognized same-sex marriages. Um, I think your legal counsel's uh, analysis is accurate, but I think additional clarity uh, because of the progress being made in a number of states um, is warranted. Okay. That, that satisfies me. In that respect, I now yield uh, for five minutes to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have a uh, growing concern about how we can possibly define the terms and enforce the terms that constitute who would be eligible and who wouldn't be eligible. I, I just I don't know how in the world it can be enforced. I don't have any idea, clue how it can possibly be um, defined. It certainly hasn't been defined in the legislation, from my perspective. Did you care to address that? Well, I would um, hope that the fact that literally thousands of private sector corporations and 
state and local <coughs> units of government um, have seen fit to enact domestic partnership registries and offer uh, employment benefits um, would give some comfort to the gentleman in terms of uh, the, the, w that it can be managed and it is being managed across this country uh, very well. We lag behind in the fact that the federal government does not offer these employment benefits. Um, but I see, uh, I, I, I think that the legislation very carefully sets forth the eligibility requirements. The affidavit is um, as, a, as a, an additional um, protection against fraud. We know we don't want people defrauding the federal government either to purport they're in a marriage that they're not or to purport they're in a domestic partnership that they're not. And so these provisions have been specifically added um, as, as strong uh, fraud prevention uh, uh, language. But I would say you should take comfort from the fact that this is done across the country and other jurisdictions of government as well as in the private sector, um, and, it, and it's working very well. Uh, Mr. Berry, one of the key or prime things that you cite as a reason to do this is the need to attract and retain employees. Where in the federal government do we have a lack of applicants for, because I guarantee I can get some applicants to probably show up tomorrow, where are we lacking in terms of being able to recruit people? Mr. Uh, Congressman, it is, uh, this is a case uh, you'd have to look at each specific uh, you know, case. And can you name one where we don't oh, have Oh, absolutely. We, right now we give direct hire authority for veterinarians, doctors, nurses, engineers, and I, the list goes on and on because we cannot effectively recruit in those professions. And so right now we don't even require competition. If, if an, a federal agency finds a nurse that they, you know, if one walked in the door and she proved she was qualified, they can hire her in the morning because we can't find them. We can't fill those jobs. And so we have uh, uh, literally these positions are, 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 are significant. They are, they're, they are one of our greatest challenges. And so in each of these areas, we are attempting to, to get out there with sharp elbows and compete with private sector, university settings, state governments, local governments, so that we can, we can provide critical services. You know, the veterinarians at the Food and Drug Administration right now, we do not have enough to do the food safety management that we need to supply for the country. Um, these are tough challenges we face as the employer for the country, and this will be just one extra tool that's going to allow us for I'm not saying it's going to solve that problem entirely, but for the same-sex partner, uh, the person who has a partner who is now working for Archer Daniel Midlands and has domestic partner benefits and who is a veterinarian, I am no way going to have that person be able to say they're going to move, relocate, and lose the health insurance for their partner uh, if, if that's their condition of federal employment. This is going to allow me now to attract that person or at least be competitive. And so I think it's, it's going to be a very powerful tool for us. Uh, you know, it's not going to solve all the problems. I'm not portraying this as a panacea. Uh, but it's going to be one important tool in the tool belt. Yeah, I, I guess I would be very curious to see a list of where you have some gaping holes. I think the American people would. I find the overall sweeping generalization, and yep. granted we have limited time here, to say that we have these big gaping holes and when our unemployment is north of 9.5 percent, I, I think if we're not sharing that with the American people, we, we ought to be. I don't see it. I'd, I'd love to see that list. I, uh, that, Mr. Chairman, as we kind of wrap up this panel here, I, I know we have others uh, waiting. Uh, I, I appreciate your passion and, and, and commitment to this. I, I, I believe in the traditional definition of marriage is between one man and one woman, that there are benefits and there are um, things that we do as a people to encourage those types, that, that, that relationship. Um, and I, I stand proud on that. And I, I, I don't think we should try to create something um, that is under a different name. That, that's my own personal opinion. I know your, your opinion would differ. And that's what makes this body so great. I hope, Mr. Chairman, as this moves forward, that we have proper time to have this debate in greater numbers um, and that there isn't some you know, uh, procedural thing that would get in the way of uh, us being able to vote in a in a broad sense uh, as, as this moves forward. So, again, I, I thank you both. I've gone over my time, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome, welcome the gentleman's remarks. Uh, I, I know we have not, as I said before, exhausted the full range of questions that might be <coughs> offered, uh, and with our continual interruptions on the floor, uh, it made it even more difficult. What I'd like to do, though, is to offer each of you three minutes each 
just if there are areas that you in this bill that you would like to amplify or issues that you feel have not been appropriately addressed, um, I give you an opportunity to do that now in closing. Uh, Ms. Baldwin, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this very generous allocation of time to review this bill with the committee and, and uh, exchange back and forth with questions. Um, I, I, I just want to summarize with a, a couple of, of points. Uh, in many ways, I regard this as um, an issue of equal compensation, both in pay and, and benefits, but predominantly we're looking at benefits um, for equal work. Uh, where you have gay or lesbian employees of the federal government who are in committed lifelong uh, relationships, they have families they wish to protect, and they are not receiving the tools to uh, uh, be able to provide those protections, be it health care, um, survivor benefits that we've talked about, uh, family and medical leave. Um, you'll hear later from uh, 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 Ambassador Guest about the, uh, the, the employment benefits related to those we ask to serve our country overseas um, that are, are very important if you want to be able to protect your, your family. And so to me, I regard this um, very much as an issue of equal compensation for, for equal work, where we have identified a glaring um, uh, discrepancy based um, merely on, um, on sexual orientation. Um, I want to respond briefly to um, the ranking member's comments uh, re relating to um, marriage um, versus this very limited, uh, uh, this very limited scope of this bill relating to fringe benefits. Marriage, at the uh, which we have um, long uh, looked to the states to uh, define and and regulate, um, is uh, a, an aggregation of literally hundreds um, in many states, thousands of benefits and obligations that are that inure to those who are able to enter the institution of marriage. Um, and so I in no way view this measure um, as limited as it is as a way to replicate uh, uh, marriage by another name. Um, and uh, if you look even to the federal level, I think it was uh, in the either the late 1980s or early 1990s that uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, request for an analysis of how many times the federal code references spouse, husband, wife, marriage. Um, again, thousands of references, lots of benefits and lots of, of obligations. Um, this in no way uh, replicates that. While I am a supporter of equal marriage rights, that is not what we uh, are here today to speak with you about. This is much more a matter of equal pay and equal uh, uh, compensation and benefits um, for those who arrive at the workplace and work uh, uh, at, their, um, at their jobs uh, diligently and deserve to have the equal respect of their employers. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Berry, for three minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, I thank you so much for the hearing today, for your opportunity, and, and Congressman Chaffetz for your engagement and involvement. appreciate uh, your attention and, and the courtesies that you've extended uh, throughout the day. Um, I would just uh, make a couple of quick points, uh, just underscoring uh, the, the President's support for this, the President's support for fairness uh, across the federal government for treating all employees equally, um, also as the Director of OPM for supporting it as, a, as an opportunity to maintain our competitive edge. Um, we live, uh, Congressman, you're right, as the, the, with the economy now, uh, for many federal positions, we have an overabundance of applicants. Uh, but we do face shortages in some critical areas that are, are very important. And um, this will be one tool that will allow us to maintain that. A and the economy isn't going to remain down forever. Um, and as we move forward in the 21st century, I think it's very important that the federal government, uh, we, we have very complicated jobs in the federal government, and they're essential to protect the life, health, and safety of our citizens. And it is essential that we be able to maintain and both recruit and retain, once we've gotten them and made substantial investment in them, the best and the brightest. And, uh, and this will be one, one of those tools, just like the rest of our health benefits packages are. Um, I'd also just like to mention there is nothing in this legislation that requires the repeal or even the amendment of the Defense of Marriage Act. Um, that this this is not an attempt uh, to uh, to seek to seek that 
Uh, though the President has made clear he supports the repeal of that uh, legislation, um, it is not required for this legislation. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to remember that as, as we're having this debate. Uh, this is a debate about, uh, you know, health benefits, life insurance, vision, and dental. Uh, it, it's about a benefit package that uh, we're just trying to provide our employees fair. It is not an attempt to redefine. It is not an attempt to overwhelm uh, by this version the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, it, it, that is not required. And so, uh, and in fact, I, I think if, uh, I would have to check this out, but uh, one of the things in terms of your questioning, uh, Mr. Chaffetz, about the heterosexual, whether we extend this benefit to heterosexual couples, actually might entangle us in DOMA. And uh, uh, whereas this legislation does not. And so uh, I think we would have to, uh, you know, we'd have to be careful with that because it, it, as we define or redefine uh, those terms in that way, it might more directly engage DOMA. This legislation now doesn't. And so I think we're best in keeping it that way and keeping it in a straightforward health benefit, employee, vision, and dental, um, and, and move forward with this as a, as a competitive tool for the 21st century. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much and, and look forward to working with you on the many technical amendments we've discussed today, and, uh, and thank you again uh, for the courtesy today. Uh, thank you both. Director Berry, Representative Baldwin, we appreciate your willingness to come before the committee and help us with our work. Uh, we bid you have a good day, and uh, we want to welcome the second panel. Thank you.